Welcome to Voices in Leadership, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. Leaders can and to leadership and I hope you find primitive. From the leadership studio where the programs and related content have received over four million views to date and counting. Today we host a discussion entitled Medicine, Academia, and the Syrian Refugee Crisis with Dr. Fadlo Curry. Dr. Fadlo Curry is the 16th president of the American University of Beirut and professor of medicine. Before that he was professor and chairman of the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology at Emory University School of Medicine. He also served as deputy director of the Winship Cancer Institute at Emory. Dr. Curry is an accomplished molecular oncologist and translational thought leader. His clinical expertise and research are focused on the development of molecular, prognostic, therapeutic, and chemopreventative approaches to improve the standard of care for patients. Dr. Curry was born in Boston, Massachusetts and raised in Beirut, where his parents were leading scholars at the AUB. Curry was motivated to return to Lebanon in 2015 to assume the position of university president by his and his family's strong and deep personal connections to the country and the university and his appreciation of AUB's enormous impact on the Arab world. With Dr. Curry's leadership, the university has solidified itself as a global player in health and formed partnerships with peer universities in Lebanon and around the world. He has defined the university as a fundamental driver of the American liberal arts ethos in the region. Before I turn this discussion over to our moderator, Dr. Howard Coe, please join me <coughs> as we welcome Dr. Fadlo Curry to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. So President Curry, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Crow. Great, great to see you. So you've had quite a career where first you've been a distinguished researcher and professor and clinician here in the United States, but then some four years ago you got appointed president of the American University of Beirut and thereby became a leader of a global university in one of the most complicated regions of the world. Tell us more about why and how that happened and how you're feeling about that. Thank you, Howard. So uh, in the interest of full disclosure, Howard was my attending as an intern in residence at all the <laughs> was, and is really one of my role models in life. So. Uh, not such an easy question, but uh, I think the, the, the reality is that if you can serve in a meaningful, purposeful way in an exciting uh, venue, which I think I've had the privilege and the honor of doing at two previous institutions, you should grab that opportunity with both hands. And in addition to the deep ties my, I, my wife, our families have with the university, I think it's just an incredible opportunity to, to lead and to participate in an institution that's had such a deep imprint on the region. I had the opportunity to serve at many levels and academia in the U.S. all the way from a section chief to an executive associate dean and a department chair. And I learned a lot. And one of the reasons I went back, Howard, is I felt that I could make a difference there at a time when there was a need for such a difference. It's a great university. It's a university that looks outward. But from the end of the Lebanese Civil War until recently, it had been too cautious. It had focused on teaching service, research, all of which are wonderful in rebuilding its academic armamentarium, its role. But other than particularly, I think, in the Faculty of Health Sciences, it had been a, become a very classical university, which it was not always a, such a classical university. It was a great university that looked to make an impact in the region. And my belief was that I wanted to contribute to that return of AUB's impact in the region, in health and in education particularly. So this is quite a time for our Lebanon. Your visit here is so timely. There's been tremendous global media attention on the unrest in Lebanon where there have been public protests against the current government, which was formed not too long ago. 
Uh, please put this in perspective for us, and then what's the role of a university in a situation like this? So the, uh, the government of Lebanon was formed in January. It took almost eight months after parliamentary elections, actually more than eight months for this government to be formed. Uh, that proved to be a, a long time. The country's economic situation did not improve during this eight months when you had a caretaker government. And since its formation, the government has been, unfortunately, ineffective. Uh, ineffective because of infighting, ineffective for, for many reasons. And a series of events led to the, the uprisings. And I think, you know, I, I summarized them in my, my article in The Atlantic. But it was a, everything leading from economic instability, an extreme uh, example of globalization where so many people were left behind, the wildfires that cost 3,000 acres of forests in Lebanon that the government uh, really combated very ineffectively. They had three planes that were fully capable of helping, helping to stop this, but they'd all fallen fallow through the, due to lack of maintenance. And then finally, the last straw was actually quite funny. It was a consumption tax on WhatsApp telephones, which people mm -hmm. use. But it proved to be the last straw. Mm -hmm. People went into the streets. They're extremely organized, these protests, without any clear leaders. There seems to be, as many are calling it, a leaderless uh, revolt. But in my view, this is the first fully pan-Lebanese uprising and, and outcry. And, and we said this, the president of the University Saint Joseph of, of Lebanon, Salim Dakesh, and I, in our statement to the, to the uh, government that this we see is the first true pan-Lebanese outcry since 1943, since Lebanese independence. It's not one sect or another sect. It's not political parties or apolitical parties. It's literally all segments of society. And for that perspective, from that perspective, I think it's a serious national yearning for a different type of state, not this post taif Accord sectarian state where the spoils are divided and and power is redistributed, but a true civil state in which all are really citizens. And that's why we, we urge the government of Lebanon to listen, to, to he, take heed, to protect the protesters, which mm -hmm. to some significant degree they, they have done, not always, and there have been failings, but to also engage in the kind of dialogue that leads, we hope, to the I want to say the building of a real nation state, which unfortunately Lebanon has not been for some 45 years. So what a, his, what a historic time, what a sensitive time. Yes. And then complicating all this is the Syrian refugee crisis that you have been in the middle of for a number of years. Uh, we have a map that we're gonna put up on the, on the monitor just to orient people, but um, everyone knows because of the Syrian civil war that's been going on for the last eight years, there've been millions of people displaced in, and coming into countries like yours, and you and colleagues have done so much to offer humanitarian relief. T tell us more about how all this is impacting Lebanon, uh, the issues that are arising, and then the relative roles of a university like yours versus other partners in trying to address this. Sure. So the, the Syrian refugee crisis in the map you see behind me shows the egress of displaced persons from Syria, from Iraq, from Libya, from other places, but this is focusing on Syria. So Syria currently has half of its, its citizens displaced. One quarter or half of that half is displaced internally, and the other quarter is displaced externally, largely to four countries, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Turkey, and to a lesser degree, but still significant, Egypt. The challenges of these four countries are very different. The smallest by far is Lebanon. So Lebanon has a population of a little above four million citizens. And between Syrian, Palestinian, and Iraqi refugees, there are about two million displaced persons. So a third of the inhabitants of the country currently are displaced persons. Uh, in the era of populism that we're seeing sweeping east and west, they're a very easy target, Howard, for blame. And there's no question that the Syrian refugee crisis has had a real economic impact on Lebanon, a deleterious impact. Mm -hmm. uh, however, that impact is being misrepresented. Um, yes, some Lebanese may be losing their jobs, but these are mostly jobs really uh, sub what I would consider working class jobs. These are very 
difficult to do jobs. There are some reports from our faculty that you and I will get into later about the degree of child labor now in play in, in Lebanon, largely Syrian child labor. So uh, the impact of, on the university as the impact of the uh, Lebanese uprising is that we should lead in a, an apolitical way. We should lead in gener as generators of knowledge, as an institution that I think has an exceptional track record at overcoming fear of the other, something that's very important inside Lebanon with its 18 different confessional denominations or sects, but also with regard to Syrians and Palestinians and others. And because we've been engaged as a university ever since the partition of Palestine in, in 1947 in helping uh, create opportunities for the Palestinian guests in Lebanon, we had a leg up, so to speak, in helping to address issues of health, of education, and of opportunity uh, in the state uh, of Lebanon for, for Syrians, and trying to reduce that tension. Formally, we played a, a role by uh, creating the opportunity for about 5,000 students between ages four and 14, and 14 and above, but largely the, the first to continue their education, sadly, right now, uh, less than a quarter of students under the age of 14, Syrian school-age kids are in school, and some data suggests that it may be as low as 2% of kids between the age of 14 and above are getting a formal education. So whether it's collaborations with, with NGOs like Kiani, uh, collaborations with Harvard, in fact, uh, in looking at mental health in this population, collaborations with some of the finest universities in Great Britain, um, particularly some of the leading schools in, in London. Um, this is the kind of opportunity for us to all work together to study the problem and on occasion to build capacity in these folks while perhaps creating opportunities uh, as we've been doing for host communities and Syrian guests to work together. So it's not win-lose, but it's more win-win. So you're going well beyond the traditional roles of academia in responding to this crisis, but then you're also trying to oversee the day-to-day -day responsibilities of educating thousands of students at AUB. Yeah. Tell, tell us more how you balance all that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a precarious and, and <laughs> frankly, a challenging balance. I probably get it wrong almost as often as I get it right uh, because for example, in the current situation in Lebanon, a lot of our students are very civically minded and they believe it's their duty as citizens to be on the streets protesting ag against a government that they openly will say is corrupt, venal, ineffective, and sectarian. None of them words of praise. <laughs> and our job is to educate these kids uh, and to make them empowered, enlightened leaders for tomorrow while somehow allowing them to, or supporting them, it's not just allowing them, they're adults, to, to exercise their civic duty, which is what they believe. Mm -hmm. So we were the first and only university to reopen last Thursday. We didn't have a majority of kids. By Friday, we did again have majority of kids. Yesterday, there were road closures, which is part of the way that people manifest their civic civil disobedience. A lot of students emailing me contacting the university saying this is unfair, you're giving an advantage to the kids who can be here versus those of us. I know you told the, the community, including us and the faculty, that there are not supposed to be any exams and nobody's supposed to be punished, but hey, we're getting homework assignments <laughs> left and right and we're stressed. So there isn't an easy formula. And I think this is similar to what we're doing with the Syrian refugee crisis. It's more acute right now because it's happening. But the Syrian refugee crisis, they're an easy target. And we see this also in the U.S. where immigrants are an easy target and we have to stand up mm -hmm. and say, that's not right. Mm -hmm. We should be helping these folks. Uh, you are gaining a group of enlightened, educated, empowered citizens for the future by not marginalizing these folks. And one of the most inspiring things I, I know I've told you previously was in one of the larger of these schools that we formed with Kayani, one young woman had written in English, and these are kids who've missed their education for anywhere between two and six, seven years. Mm -hmm. She'd written, today 
a reader, tomorrow a leader. Mm -hmm. Today you're a reader, tomorrow a leader. Mm -hmm. And I think you can't help but be inspired mm -hmm. to try to create the circumstances mm -hmm. for folks to be enlightened leaders, whether they agree with you or not. Tell, tell us more who your partners are in responding to this crisis, both regionally and globally, and how, how do you all work together? Sure, so we, we work with institutions from the United Nations, uh, you know, United Nations uh, Agency for Displaced Persons, UNDP, UNRWA. We work with universities, among them University College London mm -hmm. and, and, and many others, uh, Imperial College, others uh, in, in Europe. Certainly with a number of great universities in the U.S., we have programs with Harvard, Yale, Hopkins, among others who I'm not mentioning, Columbia, many others. Um, and then we work with a lot of uh, NGOs who uh, play an important role in Lebanon because in Lebanon the government has been ineffectual for some time. It's unfair to blame just this government. Uh, one a political uh, thinker described the Lebanese government about five, six years ago, well before this president, as not a fading state, but a, not a failing state, but a fading state. In other words, the informal economy, including in healthcare, was so predominant that people worked around the government. It didn't have a role in their lives the way we think of a government having a role in their lives. So from my perspective, we need to have real partnerships mm -hmm. that have to be producing tangible work, which is very hard to measure in a right. way. How do you measure right. success? Well, there's some easy ways. How many kids are we, we have in school? We have 5,000. The Lebanese public schools have a quarter of a million. Uh, are these kids learning? One area we ventured into with other partners, including universities abroad, uh, something AUB I don't think had done previously, and I don't deserve any credit for this. This is our Center for Civic Engagement and Community Service, led by Rabia Shibli, is to start getting into vocational training. Mm -hmm. Lebanon has 51 universities, 51 for a population of 4 million citizens, way too many. More than 80% of them are universities in name only. They're for-profit institutions. You get a diploma, but we can't measure any improvement in that young person's skill set by the time they're done. Mm -hmm. uh, and we generally don't take these kids for, for graduate school, even when we have spots. Not that they're not bright kids, they just haven't been prepared. So there's a failure of regulation, a failure of, 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 of infrastructure right now, fading of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And we try not to contest or morph into the role of the state, we try to partner with other credible partners mm -hmm. to make a difference in the lives of young people. You mentioned that you were called back to AUB because of this sense of this great history of your university. Tell, tell us more about the history of the university, sure. how big it is, uh, some, some of the other uh, dimensions of uh, AUB. Sure, so I, I love to brag about AUB. So. <laughs> so AUB was formed as the Syrian Protestant College uh, 153 years ago. Uh, it was founded by a Presbyterian missionary called Daniel Bliss, who was an Amherst-educated mm -hmm. uh, gentleman who was ordained in the faith and also had a doctorate. Dr. Bliss assembled a formidable group of faculty, largely Occidental, but some uh, Arabs. Uh, and the university was really, Syrian Protestant College was really a vehicle for not just education in, 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 in the Western liberal ethos, but it really was a school that sought to convert people to the Presbyterian faith. And mm -hmm. they were doing okay, at least with my family and my wife's family and a few others, until 1882 when a fairly devout Presbyterian professor uh, basically at the commencement address, Edwin Lewis cited the work of Charles Darwin. <laughs> Within six months, Daniel Bliss and the board had conspired to force the resignation of Edwin Lewis, and that resulted in the egress of almost all the American and European faculty from the university. But this is a, since this is about voice and leadership, I think great leaders make mistakes, but great leaders learn from mistakes. I mean, even Lincoln made mistakes and he learned from mistakes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the impressive thing about Daniel Bliss is he learned from that mistake and he redirected the institution to focus on a secular, liberal American ethos. Mm -hmm. The Bible classes stayed for a while, uh, but the focus became a liberal arts education 
and increasingly a professional education in, engineer, in medicine and pharmacy and nursing initially, but over time, engineering and other things. By the 1940s, it was clearly one of the premier universities in the world. It had become the American University of Beirut by 1920. When the United Nations was formed, more uh, alumni from the American University of Beirut signed the declaration on signed the official declaration of the forming of the United Nations and authored the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights than any other university. It had been praised in the 50s and 60s by people as diverse as the great liberal icon and a hero of mine, Bobby Kennedy, and the great conservative icon, John Foster Dulles, as clearly America's greatest intellectual asset abroad. The university came under siege during the Lebanese Civil War suffered some grievous losses. One president, Malcolm Kurt, was assassinated. Another, David Dodge, was kidnapped. Two deans uh, were uh, Robert and Jamie and Raymond Wilson were assassinated. Another was kidnapped, and uh, as was the controller, Joe Scipio. And so, so it really suffered some grievous losses. So when it emerged from the war, it took its time to re-engage society. And I think what, it, what year was that, roughly? 1990. Okay. 1990, the Civil War ended, mm -hmm. but October 1990. But 13 months after that, the iconic building, uh, College Hall, the oldest building on campus, was blown up by a uh, unknown assailant. Mm -hmm. And so that was rebuilt through philanthropy. Uh, but it took the, a while for those scars to go away. The university has been increasing its academic trajectory. It consistently ranks among the top two universities in the Arab world in academics and in, 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 in other areas. Um, we have a small faculty relative to Harvard or anyone else. We have 1,200 faculty of which about 500 are professorial track and another 300 physician educators, another 400 part-timers senior lecturers. And we have 9,500 students of whom about 7,300 are undergraduates, probably a little large for, for our campus, and 2,300 are graduates between medical doctors, master's students, and PhD students, and we're we're doing well. What, what a history! Wow, that's that's tremendous. So I'm sure everybody here and everybody watching online is asking themselves, especially with respect to the uh, Syrian refugee crisis, what can we do uh, to help or be supportive in any way? Do you have any advice for us on that? Oh, certainly. I mean, I think if you look at um, where we are internationally, this is an, and I don't use this word all that often, this is really an unprecedented humanitarian crisis since, since the Second World War. Of course, the Second World War had an enormous displacement of peoples. And I think that uh, these individuals, if you're talking about half the population of a country being displaced internally or externally, some of them will have to immigrate, some of them will return. It's not clear how many will return given the current instability in Syria, which was exacerbated a few weeks ago with the president's decision to pull out and abandon the Kurdish um, allies. The fact is these are young people who, and older people, who need an opportunity. It would be a catastrophe if all Syrians immigrated, okay? And you have the population of a country of 22 to 24 million, the the, the number of people is a little inexact given we don't know what's happened post-war, and at least in Lebanon, we've recorded an extraordinarily high birth rate, very high levels of consanguinity, large rates of <laughs> child labor, and that's one area we can maybe expand on a little bit. Uh, one of our faculty members in the Faculty of Health Sciences did the largest study on child labor that I know of, mm -hmm. of the Syrian refugees, about 4,400 young people, and she found that about one in three had suffered some form of abuse, verbal, physical, otherwise. Um, and they have kids working from age four to 18 under largely unacceptable conditions. So what can we do about it uh, for those of us who are outside and those of us who are there? Well, the first thing I think is to know the facts. Mm -hmm. In this post-truth era where there's so many versions of the truth being put out there, there are raw facts. There are, there are things that we can learn, you know, what, what is the international community doing to support these folks? Um, what is it not doing? I had a visit to the State Department early on where we had a frank disagreement. We were proposing some uh, educational programs, for, specifically vocational programs for, 
for Syrian refugees. And after one or two disagreements, Congress put together a, a, a package there. Mm -hmm. uh, for the private citizen, I think getting engaged, having the opportunity to experience it when possible, actually going there and participating. The wonderful thing about AUB is it's a very participatory culture. Mm -hmm. So we have kids who go to the far north of Lebanon to develop sustainable energy lighting up a, a village in, in Akkar, which is one of the most underserved parts of Lebanon. And we have kids working in Syrian and Palestinian refugees. I think folks can learn, can be engaged, can make a difference. Uh, there are many ways to, to help, but I think now is, a, is, is, is the time to, to be engaged and to learn. So you're a man of obvious passion and mission and purpose, both personally and professionally. How do you uh, sustain and maintain all this in a stressful time like this? Well, I think one silly but simple answer is the busier you are, for, for, at least for me, the busier I am, the less stressed I am. I, I'm most stressed on the weekends if there isn't enough to do, then I stress my partner. Um, honestly, um, and this started to crystallize when I was a house officer in, in Boston uh, at the city hospital. If you have the opportunity to serve those less fortunate, it's an incredibly energizing source. Uh, it's uh, something that I find sustainable. Of course, you have to look after yourself and exercise and eat a much better diet than I've eaten, eaten over the years. <laughs> um, but I do think it's a wonderful privilege to work on something that's important, that's purposeful. I've had the opportunity to work in the clinic, to take care of cancer patients, to do research, to teach, to mentor people, to serve, and I have no regrets over taking this role. I feel wonderfully privileged to have this opportunity at this time. I, I, I would not change that decision for a moment. I can't say that I've prepared for it uh, my whole life because I didn't even apply for the job in the beginning. I applied six days before the first interview under <laughs> pressure from the board. My, my own uh, path, which you never can keep to, at least if you plan it out, was I wanted to. I'd almost given up on being a cancer center director when I said no to Columbia and Michigan. I thought that was, that was it. Next job was a dean. So this came a little bit out of the blue. I just joined the board. But I think the opportunity to serve in a place where there's need is just something we, we prepare our whole lives for. And I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly blessed. Great. The final minutes, are there any uh, leadership thoughts or advice for the students in particular that you want to share? Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, I think a uh, few things to touch on. I mean, they've come out of things that I've learned at AUB and things that I've, I've learned through forging my own path. I think it's incredibly important to have people you trust from you, both in your personal life and in your professional life. And not only to be willing to make mistakes and learn from your mistakes, but let them make mistakes and learn from their mistakes and feel that they're gonna be supported through mistakes. Because I don't think I know of a leader through history who is successful, whether it's a department chair or university president or a pol on a political stage, who didn't pick good people, trust them, let them, make mistakes, and didn't send them to the bench the first time they fumbled the ball. Okay, so that's, I think, one of the most important things is pick the right people. Not everyone you pick is gonna be great. Not everyone you pick is necessarily even gonna be trustworthy in, but pick good people and trust them. And if you do that, I think the majority of people that you pick, you'll be able to trust. The second is, is, is I, I notice a tremendous focus on the end goal. And I think that's less important than the journey. The journey is wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's uh, incredible and you can learn so many things from it and enjoy it. Uh, a great pitcher, uh, Greg Maddox once said, under pressure, <laughs> throw softer, not harder. And I think that's true. Mm -hmm. Under pressure, slow down, break things up, you know, figure it out and don't, don't, don't make too many rush decisions. For me, I find when I rush, I make mistakes. And second, I think the third and the last thing is nobody can ever lay it out for you on a, on a map. It's mm -hmm. just, you have to take your time. I mean, whether you're doing an interview with a reporter who hands you 
one set of questions and asks you an entirely different <laughs> set. That's not the case today, but <laughs> certainly was the case in my CNN interview. Or, uh, or whether you are being placed in a role or a position that you don't believe you're really doing. Uh, I can speak personally. I don't have a lot of interest in elected politics. I, I, I don't like campaigning. And uh, I like voting. That's the part of the, the <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it's good to slow down and see how you can turn an unusual situation to your advantage. The first editorial I ever wrote 20 years ago for Medscape, now forgotten, was about turning obstacles into opportunities. Mm -hmm. If there's one piece of advice other than trusting people I would give folks, it's to look at every obstacle as a potential opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been an extraordinary interview. And President Curry, we're so lucky to have you at an incredible time like this. So thank you so much for your thoughts. Thank you. A big round of applause for President Curry.